<laughs> Check one, two, one, two. cold night out there but thank you so much for braving the wind and coming out we do have a couple of speakers this evening who have uh, agreed to say a few words for us um, <laughs> I just got to see if I can find everybody all right the first one actually we're gonna have speaking for us is someone who I'm all sure you're all familiar with is a uh, former MHA and what I call a gas guru but he calls in every man, and that would be Mr. George Murphy. Yeah. Woo! Guru gas. Happens to me all the time, they never lift the mic. <laughs> <laughs> Some things you just need to go up. <laughs> Not gas taxes. <laughs> Woo! I want to thank you all first for the uh, the warm greetings, <laughs> and uh, I think that we've got a pretty warm turnout considering the temperatures out here because I'm frozen. I don't know about the rest of you. But speaking about things cold, we've had a cold time the last couple of months, especially with the last budget. And I don't think we're getting any warm responses out of government as regards to how we exactly feel about the budget, in particular the last move the government made this afternoon uh, and last night I should say by increasing the gas tax and that's what I'm pretty upset about and I think and I think consumers in Newfoundland and Labrador are particularly upset, small business owners are particularly upset and anybody who has to deal directly with the possibility of added fuel charges are particularly upset. And I say shame on government for doing what they did. If you look at, ironically, this was Tourism Week. And what a time, what a time to announce an increase to your gasoline tax, except to hear from tourism operators how much damage they have the potential to take on this particular move made by government. At a time when Dwight Ball, when this government was talking about increasing the HST, removing the HST by 2%, not increasing the HST by that 2%, he called it a job killer. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I say to you this, that it looks like the gasoline tax increase, plus the taxes on top of that, is the real job killer. And I say shame. I don't know what thought went into it. But I can tell you this, that as regards to... Racism, you know. racism. I treat it like a freaking Jew. And every person who's got to be poor will be treated like a I got that on camera. I got that on camera. It's okay. I got okay. it on camera. Freedom of speech. Freedom of speech. Freedom of speech. Freedom of fucking speech. Fine. You can ignore it if you don't like reading it. You can ignore it if you don't like reading it. Freedom of speech. Uh, I think the intention of this group, ma'am, is to have an open mic session after. So I think that we're all taking turns. So. Uh, okay. You don't have to read it. You don't have to fucking read it. Ignore it. Don't be a fucking fascist. Let's, let's try to uh, try to keep it on track, I guess. We'll yeah, turn shit up. Ahead. Burn the book too, buddy. Burn the book. But if I want to, if I keep going here, just to give everybody a sense of what we're dealing with when we when it comes to the gas tax, I already touched on a couple of matters. But I'm a taxi driver by trade. Some of you know me from the House of Assembly, and some of you know me as being an advocate when it comes to gasoline pricing, fuel pricing, and getting notice from me. But I'm a taxi driver at heart. 
I guess a common person, a common man, woman, taxi driver down here in the back, thank you for coming and helping me out with this, the two at the same time. He's a person that's directly affected by this. And he can tell you that if he doesn't go through 60 liters in the run of the night, him and his driver in the one car, for 60 liter fill up is $12 out of that man's pocket. That's what it's costing. This is what I'm calling the Chevy Levy. And the Chevy Levy has got to go. $12 a night for him five nights in the run of a week or five days in the run of a week is going to add up to 70 bucks. 70 times four is $280 a month. We were talking, Mr. Ball and, and Ms. Bennett lifted the levy the other day. It's only $300. I'm talking almost $300 a month for a taxi driver. That's what we're dealing with. We've been hit. We're small business people. We keep the economy going. We keep people moving. We're the ones, during any time there's an any, any kind of an economic downturn, we're the first ones to feel it. Next to your stores or whatever, but we take the people to the stores. You want to take your significant other out to a movie? We're the people to take them out to a movie. We're the people to take your significant others and yourselves out to dinner. We take them out to the restaurants. The restaurants are feeling the pinch. We're feeling the pinch. This is a direct kick at us. We're dealing with that. We're dealing with the uh, jack up rates on insurance because of the tax, because of the HST on, on uh, insurance costs now. So we're getting burned. But it's not just us, it's also you. You had disposable income before this budget hit. Am I right? Yeah. That disposable income is probably gone, but that fighting chance that you had, that little light that you had at the end of the rainbow has now been extinguished. And instead, we've had a budget that didn't have any hope and there was no light at the end of the tunnel. None until at least 2023. A lot of people in this province are not going to be waiting that Hashtag long. I've already heard the stories of people leaving. <laughs> and it's probably not going to stop. So, you know, you can't tax your way to prosperity, but you can certainly tax your province to oblivion. And I'd like to remind hey, hey. the government that, of that fact, that it's just not small businesses that are being hit by this increase gas tax and the HST on top of it. And like I said, it wasn't just a 16.5, but government collected twice on this. When you figure it out again at the end of the month, the federal government are probably also going to get their share of this too. So we're paying a couple of different ways here and we don't get a chance to collect anything in return. So I want to thank you all for the invitation to speak here today with just a casual reminder to government that we probably have no more money now to spend. You've taxed us to the hilt, we can't take it anymore. And it's time to repeal this tax, to change your mind on it, come back with a budget full of hope and vision, something that we can have a little bit of optimism about and a positive energy that we can have for our future. Give us back our future, Mr. Premier and Ms. Finance Minister, and then we'll carry on as a province and we'll fight for our province too at the same time. But don't grind us down into the dirt like this gas tax is done. This was the last straw. Thank you very much. Mr. Murphy for that lovely speech. Next we have another speaker, uh, the Honorable Paul Lane, now independent. Hey! A lot of support for this man, so give it up for Mr. Lane. Thank you. I, I'd like to say that I'm glad to be here today but I'm not glad to be here today. And if you were to ask me uh, a month ago, would I be standing on the... Okay. Would I be standing on the steps of the Confederation Building protesting the government that I ran for? I'd say you were crazy. Fucking and right. I am 
absolutely floored, I'm absolutely shocked, and I feel absolutely deceived. And that's the truth. We've often heard, we've often heard the expression, you hear people talk about the snake oil salesman. And I gotta be honest with you, when I think back, knocking on doors in my district, people who I represent, many people who I've represented in the last, after the last, ele before the last election and municipally for eight years, a lot of people I've known, friendships I've made and knocked on their door and I made promises to them based on what was in that platform. And I gotta tell you, when I reflected on that after I saw that budget, that's what I felt like was a snake oil salesman. I really did. And I said, not gonna happen. Good man. Not gonna happen. Woo! Now we're here today to protest the gas tax. And it's interesting, I'll tell you a quick little story. I, I thought it was kind of amusing, but it's also, I suppose, it, it speaks to the issue of the gas tax. I saw a posting on uh, Facebook last night, and the guy said, the taxes are gone, the, the tax on gas has gone that high in Newfoundland. I actually saw Ed Martin at Costco last night filling up his jerry cans. <laughs> 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 but uh, but uh, but I, I guess to, to to get a little serious here, this is not just about the gas tax. It's certainly not just about the gas tax for me. It's about the cumulative. It's about the cumulative impact of all the taxes on the people. It's too much, too fast. That everybody agrees, right? It's too much, too fast. And you know. Um, I, I can remember when we had the, um, the government renewal initiative and uh, they were going around the province and they were talking to people and there were regional sessions that were being put off by ministers and some of the people in the Confederation building and the Office of Public Engagement were assisting and so on. And then there were also uh, a couple of MHAs, including myself, who uh, I had my own public engagement session and uh, I did it legitimately. I did it you know, with the best of intentions, I had it over at the community center at Southlands, invited people to come and talk about what, you know, what they wanted to see in the budget. To talk about, you know, if there were things that you could live without, what would they be? If there were things that government could do to save money, what would they be? And I'll be honest, that there was, there's no doubt, there was probably a person who talked about, well, if we're in tough times, we might have to raise income tax. There was somebody who said that, I can remember that. There was somebody who said, maybe the gas tax is the way to go. Put a few cents on gas, because we all have to do our part. And or people said, you know, we have to make cutbacks in certain areas. But I don't recall, and, and the HST, people said, well, you know that promise that was made on the HST, maybe we can't do that. But I gotta be honest with you, I do not recall, and I challenge any member of the House of Assembly, any member in the government, any minister to come out here and tell you that they went to a public engagement session where somebody said, I got an idea for you. Let's tax everybody to oblivion. That's an idea. That's a great idea. I bet you nobody said, let's up the HSC. Let's up the income tax. Let's up the gas. Let's impose a levy. Let's, uh, let's up every fee that we have, let's create new fees that we don't have, and let's do it all at the one time. I can guarantee you there's nobody said that. Nobody. And this did not need to happen. It did not need to happen. We could have done it in a, re in a more reasonable fashion. Everybody knows that we are in trouble financially. Everyone knows we're in a fiscal crunch. Everybody knows something has to give. Everybody is prepared to pay their share. But there's no point in saving the province from bankruptcy while in the same time you're gonna put your people in bankruptcy. And beyond the taxation, beyond the taxation, there's other things that were done that just doesn't make sense to me. You know, we have our school system which is absolutely shameful when you think about it. People were talking about the need for full-day kindergarten. We all know that the research is there that would say that full-day kindergarten is a good thing. Everybody supports that in principle. 
But do we do it at the expense of the kids who are already in school? No. Does that make sense? It makes no. no sense to me. We've got we've got children with special needs that are not going to get the resources that they need, and I think that that's absolutely shameful. We're going into multi-grading. I think that's absolutely shameful. We're jamming kids into a classroom that's not big enough for them to be in. That's absolutely shameful. We're going to have a French lottery. We're going to draw names out of a hat to figure out which child gets to do French and which one doesn't. Absolutely shameful. And we're doing all these things because we want to implement something new that we've never had before. It makes no sense, and it's not saving any money. That's the thing about it. This is not a cost-cutting measure. If anything, it's going to cost them more money to wreck the system that we already have. It did not need to happen. It makes no sense. Now, I've stood in the House of Assembly time after time, as have other members of the, of the opposition, and we've appealed to the government, please, make some change. Listen to the people who elected you. I know that you're hearing from the people. I know you're getting the emails. I know you're getting the phone calls. I know you're getting the Facebook messages, the Twitter messages. I know you're getting it all because I'm getting it. And I'm being copied on a lot of the stuff that you're getting. I know you're getting it. The people are the, pe the people is who put you here. And please remember that in four years' time, it will be the people that are going to turf your ass out of here. Right. Woo! Sadly, sadly, it has fallen on deaf ears. Sadly, it has fallen on deaf ears. But, but, it's still not too late. And I just spoke in the House Assembly. They're sitting in the House Assembly now, actually, because we're debating the income tax bill to actually check up the income tax. Mm -hmm. And I just finished speaking on that bill. And I told the members, I appealed to them once again, it's still not too late. Just because the budget was actually voted on, so what? That doesn't mean anything. There's nothing to stop the government to come into the House of Assembly on Monday with amendments That's right. that we can all yeah. live with. Yeah. It can happen. They have the ability to do it. They need to listen to the people. To date, they have not been listening, but it is up to each and every one of us collectively in this province to make them listen. So I'm encouraging everybody, do not give up the fight. Don't think that just because the actual budget vote is done, that this budget is done. That is not true. They can come in at any time and make changes. Keep the pressure on. Don't let this issue go. Don't let them get away with bankrupting the people of this province. I can guarantee you one thing. I make this commitment to you right here and right now. That as long as you're prepared to fight, I'm prepared to fight right alongside with you. Thank you for having me. Thank you, the Honorable Pauline. I don't know if anybody else in the House on the Liberal side can still have the title Honorable. But <laughs> He's got it. I digress. Anyway, I'd like to introduce our last scheduled speaker for the evening is a very well-known local um, local attorney as well as an activist and advocate for mental health. I'd like to invite Mark Rushi to come speak. Now, can everybody hear me? Yes, okay. All right, so what am I doing here? I know George is here and George is the tax man. I know Mr. Lane is actually sitting in the house and doing the right thing and defending all of us and standing up for the right thing. So what am I doing here? Well, what I'm doing here, I guess, is I've been an activist now for the better part of 10 years. And I know a thing or two about keeping the heat on certain issues and generating change through collective action and through unity. I'm also here because I'm 37 years old and I know a thing or two about how a lot of people in my generation feel about things like party politics and houses of assembly and all that sort of stuff. And I know that there are a lot of very disappointed and extraordinarily frustrated people right now out there in the community trying to deal with this issue at every age level and every socioeconomic bracket. And I see the work that they're doing and I see the efforts that they're making to make things like this event happen. 
and I get frustrated when I realize that after a steady month of protests, people faced with some hard realities are starting to sit back and think, well, what can we do now? The budget isn't passed. Well, like Mr. Lane just said, they can change it at any time. There is no artificial deadline or boundary, okay? That's not how government works. Things can change when people want them to change. And they're only going to change if you keep asking for them to change in an orderly, unified, and intelligent way, which is exactly what you have all been doing, and I applaud you for it. We have been going through some profoundly interesting times in Newfoundland and Labrador over this past few months and few years, in fact. It was just recently I read on VOCN that there was an individual talking about how this period actually looks like the period leading up to that time when we lost our independence. Yeah. We've gone through a gaggle of leaders, a bunch of controversies, back and forth, up and down, economic booms, and here we are in a situation that I don't think any of us thought we were going to be in. And we actually made the national news today with respect to what's going on. It is a very serious situation. And at the very first rally, the first big one anyway that happened, I spoke at that and I said at that time, this is a long-term project in a lot of ways. This is gonna take some time to play out no matter what happens, independent of things like resignation and all this, it's gonna take a long time. And people need to keep their eye on the ball, and they need to keep watching, and they need to keep paying attention. And they also need, I sorely believe, to keep hope that we actually can facilitate positive change in the aftermath of this. And it can happen because everybody in this province is very upset. Everyone, I mean, who isn't upset at this point with what is going on? Everyone is concerned, and it, it, it doesn't matter on what level you're on, there's some level to be upset and concerned, and everybody knows we're having tough financial times, but everybody also knows there were better ways of doing this. What I want you to think about is if you're out there, and you're in an organization, or you're an activist, or you're an MHA, or you're someone trying to affect policy, what do you need to be able to do that? What do you need to be able to drive forces inside? What you need is people like you out here constantly raising these issues to have the power and momentum that make your voice heard in there. Do not fall prey to believing that there is no connection between what happens on the steps and what happens in the house because there is. You are responsible for the modifications to that levy, not the federal government. You are responsible for making that happen. That's right, and more will happen. And these are going to be very interesting and complex and potentially difficult times. And it's gonna take time. I know there's a lot of people who are saying they're gonna to have to move away as a result of all of this. And that's a damn shame. But for those of us who can stay, we have to keep doing this together. We have to keep doing this together for the future of Newfoundland and Labrador, for the children we have or will have, and for everything that is going on here. We cannot just simply let this slide away, and we won't. It is not going to happen that way. There's an army of speakers and an army of people who will relentlessly appear time and time again, every time an issue comes up, to ensure once and for all, for the first time that I'm aware of in Newfoundland and Labrador's history, people don't just forget about these issues. And whoever sits in those seats in the final analysis, and whoever is the government is gonna to have to deal with you too, and I don't want you to ever be quiet ever again. It's time to grow up as a province. It's time for Newfoundland and Labrador to grow up and to actually stand up and ask for what it deserves and make sure that finally, for once in 500 years, the people are looked after and not someone else in some high house somewhere or somewhere far away. You, you and me, we are the people who deserve to be looked after in this province. And we will be. Absolutely, sir. Absolutely. It's in our it's in our blood and spirit. It is inside of us, and it is who we are. It is who we are, and a lot has happened. A lot has happened in our history to bring us to this point. Where we can actually stand up and start articulating who we are to people who need to hear it. And we're going to keep doing that, and we're going to keep growing, and we will mature, and we will change Newfoundland and Labrador for the better.
in our lifetime. And thank you very much for having me. I hope I've been able to help and contribute. Mark, that was a great speech, as all of them were this evening. Thanks for the three scheduled people who came. We would like to open it up to have a quick open mic. It is pretty cold, <laughs> so I understand if that line is short, but closer to where the sun is, there's a little table there that says CANL. That's for Coordinated Approach NL. We have a sign-up sheet for a newsletter, as well as we do have some business cards. I think we're circulating with our contact information, so you can stay informed on any events we have. I know that you know a lot of people hoped we'd get 150, 200 people showing up tonight, but the fact that it, each and every one of you showed up, showed up tonight on a cold night, on a, right before you had supper, even. The fact that y'all came here is very much appreciated. And we're going to keep doing more events and keep engaging people and keep pushing forward because we are the people of this province and we will be listened to. So thank you very much. And like I said, if anybody wants to come to the floor and have a quick, quick couple minutes to say something, they certainly can. If not, we also have a camera that is going to be set up at that table. If you would like to record a message for the Premier, for any of the ministers, or your MHA, Please come down, do so. We will make sure that it gets on Twitter, Facebook, and that we email it to all of them. So let's have a little bit of a media storm there for you. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. I just want to talk about, from the average person's point of view, what it's like to live in this province now. What it's been like, especially for families who live in my neighborhood, they're already starting to feel the crunch. They're already starting to feel that money pinch, especially when they go to the grocery store and they used to be able to get a hundred dollars worth of groceries, now it looks like 50. People are now being denied certain medications for their various illnesses because of this budget. People are being cut off of things that you wouldn't think they'd ever be cut off of. People can't even get dentures anymore. People can't even eat sensible. We, we're forced as the population with the low income are forced to eat a diet pretty much high in sodium. All of these things are, ki are going to kill our people. They're going to cause sickness and illness. And I ask you, how does that save money? It doesn't make sense. You know, I heard the story today that, you know, there are volunteers out in this community that spend countless hours giving and giving and giving and they're driving their own vehicles to and from to help the sick to help the poor those people who are going to the food banks to drop off food all of this is going to be costly now because we have a tax that's going to make it almost impossible for some you're talking about like for instance meals on wheels which is delivered by seniors who volunteer their time, who are on pension. And now they're forced to reconsider whether or not they can volunteer anymore because of this. Is, is, this, is this the province you want to see? Is this the province we all want to live in? This is a province for the people. We run the government. And they have to realize that. 
when it comes down to putting that X on the ballot, who are you going to put the X on for? Are you going to put it on for these guys? No. no. Absolutely not. Fuck Exxon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. You're awful. Awesome. <laughs> but, you know, I came up here the other day when the budget was being voted on, and, and I took my time, and I walked over there, and I looked out on the city, and I said, man, how many people are going to suffer? How many people are going to be hurting when this is all rolled out? You know? And it just breaks your heart. It broke my heart that day. I was in such shock, and I was so angry, and, you know, I, I was beside myself. I had to go home. I had to take a walk home <laughs> just to blow off some steam. Okay. And, you know, there are so many people who are going to be forgotten. There are so many people who are going to fall through the cracks, like that autistic boy who needs special help at school. That cancer survivor who still needs medication just to get by every day, that person who has to suffer with pain, these are the people that matter. That person that you see collecting bottles and cans, that person matters. Hey, here, here, here. here. That, that fisherman who's out there risking his life on these seas are who matter. It is those who are in the water first who matter. Here, here. And those who are at the health sciences right now battling for their lives, they matter. Here, here. And those children over in the Janeway, they matter. So we all matter, and we need to stand together as people and fight the good fight, and my God, I'm going to fight until I can't breathe no more. Long live Newfoundland and Labrador. This is my first time ever speaking at a rally, but I'm honored. More power to us. <laughs> the people. The people power. Um, my name is Ed Sodden, and uh, some of you know me, some of you don't know me, some of you read my letters about pharmacare and social justice, mental health. Um, I know Mark a number of days from the CMHA and the Coalition for Mental Health. And the thing is, it's sad. It's sad that this so-called liberal government, they're acting much similar to the Harper Conservatives in Ottawa, and especially in health care. I mean, Tommy Douglas said one time back in 1983 that there are certain interests that just want to strangulate our public Medicare system. And it's happening while we're t talking, while we're here today. Unfortunately, the people in power, do they really care about our Medicare system, about the system that our parents and our grandparents and our family members have fought for since 1960s or even before that? since the Great Depression. The thing is, uh, Medicare is a sacred trust, but the thing is, people like Dwight Ball, a pharmacist by profession, and Dr. Haggy should realize that with poverty and unemployment, there's a social determinant to what makes us sick. You know, mental health issues, physical health issues, addiction issues, so on and so on and so forth. You know, everybody, you don't have to be a social worker or a psychiatrist or a medical doctor to figure it out, nor an economist. But what they're doing is really hurting us in so many ways, whether you live in rural Newfoundland or you live in an urban center like St. John's. And with the gas tax, it's going to make people, it's, it's going to make life more expensive for people you know, having to go to their doctor appointments and see the specialists, going to the cancer center, going to the Janeway. Not only for people who are ill, but the care caregivers. Right. Yeah, right. and groceries too, and our medication, and our medical supplies. Everything goes up because our transportation costs go up because of this notorious uh, theory. tax, whatever you want to call it. 
You know, like I've never seen any province in the history of our country, Canada, or Newfoundland and Labrador, act in such a way as total disregard for our people and our help. I mean, Mark, I don't know if you agree with me, but I think this budget is bad for our mental health, and our collective mental health. And the thing is, you know, it's sad. It's really sad that this government in this building, in our building, it's not their building, it's our building. <laughs> yeah, it's our, the people's building. You know, like, don't they care about what the cutbacks to uh, the drug plan? Don't they care about the, ending the adult dental program? Don't they care about low-income seniors? You know? And, and it, it's really sad. They put a price tag on people who have uh, serious dental problems and they can't afford to go to the dentist. They have, they don't seem to care. I mean, of course, they can absorb the cost, the high cost. I mean, they're well, well to do. They're the corporate, the political elite. They can afford it, but for us, the lower middle class, we got to struggle. We get, we got to pay for their mistakes, yeah. their mismanagement. Here, here. You know, people talk about Muskrat Falls. You know what? <laughs> it seems funny in a, in a sad sort of way. I mean, this uh, Ed Martin Premier Ball fiasco it reminds me of the Young and Restless with Victor Newman and Jack Abbott. What are they trying to do? Uh, try to become actors in a soap opera, young and restless? It's, it should be the old and hopeless. You know? They must be in another world. I mean, it could it be like the days of our lives? I don't know. But anyways, it makes a good soap opera. That's for sure. But the thing is, uh, Thank God they didn't show up in the Republic of Doyle. But, you know, the thing is, uh, you know, this is the worst budget I've ever read or seen or heard about since my days in Ontario. I mean, Ontario in 1995, I don't know if you're familiar with Ontario politics or history, but the thing was that Mike Harris budget was really bad. I mean, the homeless rate went up, and they slashed welfare rates by 21%. And, you know, the liberals are kind of like the, the conservatives back in Ontario, back in that era. You know, they remind me. You know, as a matter of fact, if you're a Star Trek fan, I know there's a culture statement with Captain Kirk on it, but the thing is, what makes may make you think is that this liberal government <laughs> reminds me of the Borg on Star Trek because they say the Borg uh, the, the Borg collective says uh, you know uh, get ready to be assimilated resistance is futile <laughs> that's their motto you know and you know what I don't understand is <laughs> Where do these liberals come from? They don't act like liberals. They're from another planet. I mean, even even the the liberal government of Ontario is more advanced than this liberal government. I mean, the minister of health in Ontario, uh, Eric Hoskins is his name, is more advanced. He's trying to reform the health care system in Ontario by providing. Uh, free med uh, dental care for low-income earners. And, you know, the rest of the country, you know, we can talk, compare ourselves with Alberta. I know it's apples and oranges, but every other province is, is advancing forward, whether they're Liberal, NDP, Saskatchewan Party, whatever. But this government is going backwards. I mean, with all the cuts in the health care system throughout this province and the programs like our drug plan and our dental plan for seniors and the working poor, 
you know, you think, okay, they're going to save money. Yeah, they're going to lower the deficit. You know, it sounds like Preston Manning and the Reform Party. The deficit. There's so much talk about the deficit. But anyways, back to my point. <laughs> back to my point is the fact is they think they're going to save money and then reduce deficit, but in the long term, it's going to cost them more because people who can't get their dental care or their drugs end up in the hospital system or in some health care institution costing us a lot more money. So that's very short-sighted, and I don't, I don't understand who makes this budget. Uh, Kathy Bennett, I'm, again, a soap opera in another world. You know, like, <laughs> I just don't understand this government. I really don't understand them. They must be from another planet. But anyways, the thing is, is uh, I know I've talked a lot, but the thing is, uh, you know, we've got to keep the faith. we got to persevere. We can't give up. we got to be vigilant. And we got to let them know what is right and what's wrong uh, with this budget. And there's a lot of raw, bad things about this budget. And, and if they don't do something about it, 2019, we will do something about it. So anyways, that's all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, if I could say a few words, I'd be a better public speaker. Right? Thank you everyone for coming out today. My name is Michael Patrick Collins. I'm here representing the Newfoundland and Labrador People Party. This is a new party that's coming up that wants to open an honest form of government for the people, by the people, and is answerable only to the people. This party will give people of Newfoundland and Labrador an alternative to the big three that don't really care about the people of the province at all. The Newfoundland and Labrador People's Party are not doing this for the money or the glamour, but for the love of the province and for the greatest people on the planet. We are tired of being used, lied to, cheated, and taxed to death. We're not going to take it anymore. Closing our schools, libraries, and book tax. This is the government's way of trying to dumb us down and keep us in the dark. But we have never been more aware or enlightened about their dirty tricks. Closing senior complexes and hospitals. Why is that? To privatize everything and make obscene profits off the backs of the seniors who paid taxes all their lives. And for what? To be taxed more and nowhere to live? No one to care for them and no respect at all? The province is going broke and giving out bonuses to every Ed, Dick, Tom and Harry for what? Putting us in further hole? Enough is enough. And on top of that, the gas increase, which affects the province as a whole, socially and economically. Apparently. Yet the government don't even care because we're paying for their gas too as well. Well, enough is enough. The Newfoundland and Labrador People's Party is here to make a difference and a change in the way we think and the way we do things. No more that's the way it is or that's the way it always was or has been. No more backroom deals to benefit the politicians' bank accounts. It's the people's time and the time is now. We used to be the doorstep for the world, now we're the doormat. Well, let me tell you something. The People's Party are not my taking my. this anymore. The people of the province are taking this province back, back from the banks and the governments, and put into the hands of the people where it belongs. God guard thee, Newfoundland and Labrador! Hi guys, uh, I won't be too long. Uh, my name's Anthony Murphy, I've lived here my whole life. Um, I should probably move because I'm going to go broke staying here, but I'm not going. They can't throw Good me and my wife out of here. Uh, this is my first time coming down to March with y'all. Uh, I'm ashamed that this is my first time, but, uh, well, <laughs> Better out than in. the other day, um, you know, amongst all the pathological pattern of lies that's come out of the Premier's mouth, he said that he gave us 24 hours notice before they vote on the yeah, budget. Yeah. And he did. He, he 
Uh, the one day I stayed off social media, that's the day that he rammed it through. The day that you're all probably at work and you, yeah. you couldn't come down, they rammed it through. <laughs> so, we haven't talked much about Nalcor today, but I want to put that out there that the amount of duplicity <laughs> and deception that's been put on us is preposterous, it's repugnant. And if Floyd Ball was any kind of a man, he would resign. He would resign this morning. Uh, he would have resigned yesterday. This is what Harper did to our country. This is what Rob Ford did to our country. It created this idea that if you're a politician and you win an election, you are scot-free until your term is up. That you don't have to take account for anything that you say. That you don't have to live by your word. The idea that working for an elected position, that's public service. They are here to serve the public as opposed to victimize the public. And since the moment they've entered office, that's all they've done with it. They've victimized us and refuse to acknowledge anything they've done. They refuse to entertain that there could be another way to do this. They refuse to even listen to us. And uh, th there's a couple times I was going to come down here, and I was so angry that I was afraid of probably being locked up for something I'd say or do. <laughs> so I held off for today. But here I am, in peace, in solidarity with all of you. Keep fighting, guys. Don't here, don't here. let them win. Thank you. Yeah. Woo! Hi, guys. I won't keep you because I know you're all frozen. Uh, I just want to say quickly that I am a regular, ordinary, Judy Lunchpail, blue-collar worker. Uh, I've paid my taxes since I'm 15 years old. I've never, ever protested anything until now. <laughs> I've been at the last probably three protests, and uh, it frustrates me somewhat that uh, I hear a lot of people complain, and I can't seem to motivate. I try very hard to get my friends and family to partake and get up off their arses and get out here with us and share their voices, because the more pressure that we can put on, every day we can be here. I know it's like a small group here today, but this will be in the paper tomorrow. This will be on media tomorrow. And the more that we can stay in the media and on the papers and whatnot, the more puts pressure on these guys. And we, gotta, we can keep up. I wasn't going to come here today. I was so dejected when the budget got ran through, like the last speaker said. Excuse me. I was very dejected. They were supposed to give us 24 hours notice. I was here at the last House of Assembly when I seen them uh, do the amendment on the uh, levy. Pissed me off. Uh, but I wasn't going to give up, and they said they were going to give us 24 hours, and we were going to rally and come down and show what we were made of, and then they did, they did us dirty again. And so, you know, I wasn't going to come. I was so pissed off with it all. I said, they're going to do what they want to do, but then today, I was at work, and I said, no, I still got to come. Yeah. I still got to stand yep. with everybody in solidarity, yeah. because I can't sit there and do nothing. Exactly. It's time for Newfoundland and Labradorians to get up. Stand up, rise up. rise up, tired of this shit, I am fed up, yeah. and everybody got to get up and get their asses down here and join us, don't get complain, up. don't just sit there, that's what Newfoundlanders always used to do, this is the first time New I've friend. actually felt pride, yep. and I got to take this time to thank all the organizers who accomplished so much in the last month, you guys rock, you guys are awesome, and without you guys, None of this would be happening, and I really, 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 really thank you guys for motivating us, and I just hope that I can motivate a couple to come down with us next time. So thank you. See you at the next one.
Paul? Mr. Lane? Yeah. How my name you? is Jim Parsons. I wanted to actually apologize to you. I got my camera running here. Oh, yeah. I'm for, I have to apologize yeah. to you because I made a joke at your expense on YouTube before you became an independent. Oh. And I totally no have to take it back. No worries. I man. was wrong, Mr. Lane. <laughs> no <You're, worries. laughs> You did really well. No I'm worries. glad you've done what you've done. Thank you. And All thank good. you. Keep All it up. Good, buddy. Woo! Hey,